Ladies and gentlemen, there are few things in life that can occur with a 100% success rate. But every now and then, on a chessboard, that is exactly what happens. A person sits down, and it is a perfect storm of neurons firing in the brain. Maybe it was a strong tea or coffee that they had. Maybe they felt inspired, listened to some music. Maybe they had a good workout. But every single move they played was the best possible move in that moment. And that is what I will be showing you in today's video. And before I do, I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, 80,000 Hours. Folks, chess is ageless. Kids as young as two and three are now learning how to play the game, and people in their 90s and even hundreds enjoy the game as well. But in between those two age ranges, you are likely gonna have something called a career, and careers are long. How long? 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, for 40 years. That's 80,000 hours. And 80,000 hours is a nonprofit that aims to help people have a positive impact with their career. That's why they called themselves 80,000 hours. Some people get pushed into a career because someone told them to do that. Others get pushed into a career because that's the way to make the most money. Some people stumble into a career as a last resort. There's a wide range of reasons why people end up doing what they do. But if you've ever felt like you were struggling to make a difference with your career, 80,000 hours can help. You see, they've spent the last 10 years conducting research alongside academics at Oxford University to help people understand what's the best way to land a career that will have a positive and fulfilling impact. Right now, you can go to 80,000hours.org forward slash Gotham or click the link in the description to be sent a free copy of their in-depth career guide, which can help you learn about what makes for a high impact career, get new ideas for impactful paths, and ultimately make a new plan based on what you've learned and then put it into action. Make your 80,000 hours count. Now let's get back to the video. Thanks, sponsored Gotham. This game was played by one of the current superstars of chess in India, Pragnananda Ramesh Babu. Prague is currently playing in Prague. I'm not joking, he is playing in Prague. P-R-A-G-U-E, the city in the Czech Republic. His opponent is Vincent Kaima from Germany, and you're just going to want to enjoy this game. I'm not a huge fan of, you know, making videos with one game in them. I do it, you know, a decent amount with like low elo chess and every now and then with high level chess. But um, yeah, for this one, we can just sit back, relax, and maybe one day chess.com will fix this new bug where our letters get cut off. So his name is Pra, because the G's are getting cut off. Here we go. Pra opened the game with E4. It's a classical game of chess. They have 90 minutes on the clock. And since it's a long game, Vincent Keimer plays E4, E5. We have knight f3, knight c6, all standard stuff, and now bishop to c4. And black here can play bishop c5 or knight f6. Uh, generally, at the high level, black does not play anything else. Knight f6. And so now, uh, a lot of newbies would play knight to g5, going for knight takes f7. Very typical uh, stuff for... I mean, it's, it's not even a bad opening at the high level. You just have to know your stuff. For amateur level, knight to g5, going for fried liver is very common. But at the high level, they just kind of play the position slowly. So d3 defends the pawn in the center of the board. Uh, black develops the bishop to c5 and white castles. I mean, look, top, like even top level chess mirrors low level chess. I mean, you, you're supposed to put pawns in the center, knight and bishop and castle, right? Uh, and now Vincent plays a6, which is an interesting move. Generally, the setup here for black is to play a6, d6. You could play d6 now. Uh, a6 or a5 control white's advancement on the queen side, and both of these moves get the bishop out of the center, where, you know, white's plan is generally to play c3, d4, because white has not actually moved the knight to c3, whereas black did, they had to do that to defend the pawn in the center. So these are kind of like the meta strategies of the position. So white plays c3, right? White plays c3, looking for b4 and looking for d4. Vincent gets the bishop out of the center, so it's a sniper from a distance. White plays a4, taking space and preventing black from playing b5, also opening up the same idea for their bishop. Rook e1, defending the pawn in the center of the board in order to enable a future pawn to d4. Uh, black castles, and now white plays this move h3, right? Preventing bishop to g4. This position has been reached like thousands of times. Thousands and thousands and thousands of games have been played in this position. Vincent Keimer now plays a move that he himself 
has played before. He played this move in 2022, but it's a move that now takes the amount of games played in this position to less than 10. So from thousands to less than 10. Black can play a lot of things. H6, you know, like, like there's a million different types of setups here. He plays knight h5. So Vincent is responsible for really the only other major game in the database to play knight h5. And he played it two years ago against Grandmaster Andrei Velikitian uh, from Ukraine at the Douglas Isle of Man Grand Swiss. There was a tournament there. Uh, and I only know this because I analyzed this before and I did my homework. Knight h5 is just a very provocative move, trying to activate the queen, trying to activate the knight, and also trying to play f5 in the future, as long as you're not going to be hanging your king. Which, by the way, should be legal. I'm just going to say this right now. It should be legal to hang your king in chess. Like, if, if, if you want to play f5 here and lose, you should be able to do that. Anyway, knight h5. And in that game two years ago... White went uh, uh, bishop g5. I now the knight went back. And you may ask, why would black do that? Why would black repeat? Well, what black wants to do is use the bishop as a battering ram. So for example, knight bd2. Like, well, that would, that would be very terrible, not, not, not h5. Uh, what black wants to do is actually play g5. Like, in a lot of positions... Uh, you want to go here and you want to start attacking white on this side of the board. So it's almost like a bait. Like you, you're kind of like baiting your opponent into playing this move, right? Prague, however, plays d4. So Vincent has only ever had this position once and his opponent went here. Prague plays d4. And so now we, we are in a situation where there is only one ever game played in the database. And that person went here. Retreating the bishop. I told you, this is sort of Black's idea. Black is baiting in the dark squared bishop and is saying, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna push you out. And now, Pragnananda, instead of playing bishop g3 and retreating, plays knight takes g5. That's bold. Knight takes g5 is one of the most iconic sacrifices in chess, where you sack the knight for two pawns you maintain a pin, and the enemy king is open. And this is a good exchange in several situations. In situations where only the queen is able to defend the pin knight. If the bishop was here, this would be idiotic. But when the queen has to guard, it's a lot harder for black to move. Another moment where this is good is if white can get a very quick queen f3. So if white can get a few pieces over to help quite fast, this sacrifice is pretty good. And of course, black has to be castled. So Prague sacrifices the knight and basically says... Make a move. Make a move. Do something. Right? Because white is going to go here, here, queen f3. So just so you understand, if king g7, rook e3, right? Let's say like pawn takes d4, rook f3 or rook g3, and white is winning. Like white just immediately wins because white just gets the knight back right away. So black needs to act right now. The computer recommends immediately shredding open the position and then, you know, preventing rook e3. If here, here, rook a3, uh-oh, 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 king g7, knight c3, knight d5, and I mean, all of a sudden, the computer's reconsidering. So you gotta be really, really careful. Vincent plays king h7. Now, he played that move instantly. So, clearly, Vincent actually knows the position. Vincent knows this sacrifice. Prague thinks for a bit, plays queen f3. You'll notice that Prague's time spent of five minutes and, you know, three minutes. You, it, he's probably somewhat knowledgeable in this. Maybe he vaguely remembers this from some sort of analysis, but he's probably on his own. Now, Vincent has to go king g6. This is crazy. Look at this. He sacrifices a knight, and then he has to walk the king to defend the knight and not just defend the knight. It's not just defend the knight. He's also threatening the bishop. The king triumphantly walks out and then immediately scurries back to safety where he will no longer be under any threat. So the black king is out on g6. This is insane. Prague plays bishop h4. And the idea of bishop h4 was to get out of danger and threaten queen g3. So now the queen is coming in, the rook is coming in. At this point, Vincent takes on d4 because that prevents rook e3 and also enables knight e5. So it's a very tense position and Prague is down two points. He's down a knight for a pawn. 
And right now, Black is doing an excellent job defending himself. So what is Prague going to do in this position? Gives a check on g3. King goes back to h7. Now, if Prague goes queen f3, they're not going to make a draw. They're not going to make a draw. You know what's going to happen? Knight e5. Boink. You get forked. So you can't do that. So king h7. Now Prague plays bishop g5. So he sneaks forward a little bit. He wants to play queen h4 check, which would be absolutely devastating. It's a perfect move. Bishop g5 with the intention of queen h4. And again, queen h4 would be decisive because you threaten the knight and you have queen h6 mate. So bishop g5. Vincent, rook h8. That's Vincent's first thought, right? Like, it seems like he, he, he was familiar with the position. He plays rook h8. Rook h8 is crazy. What does rook h8 even begin to do? What rook h8 does is if you give a check, I now get my king here, and you can't go queen h6. So rook h8 anticipates the check. And rook h8 is literally an example of call an ambulance, call an ambulance, but not for me. For you. So rook h8. Now Prague thinks plays knight d2. Right? Prague is getting a knight into the game. He's, he has to. Now the funny thing is, is he's not even taking this pawn back. He, he knows that time is of the essence. He needs to bring another piece to the party. He has bishop d3 ideas. He has knight f3 ideas. So it's a moment in time here, right? Blank here can play knight e5, which is definitely the most natural move. I think Vincent didn't like this. Probably because of something like rook a3. This same idea of bringing the rook. It's a very dangerous position because white is just going to very quickly get some pieces over here. And by the way, you see how this pin is just eternal? But Vincent comes up with a brilliant defensive idea of his own. Vincent plays queen g8. Rook h8 and queen g8. Look at this. Giving up the knight completely. The knight is just completely for free now. But you can't take it. Because if you do, I play queen g3, fg3. Every time a piece moves in chess, something opens. Now you get hit with this. And that bishop is a sniper. And you're going to lose your knight and the rook is hanging. So you cannot play bishop f6. So what do you do? Because if you give black a couple more moves, he's going to bring in the heavy artillery. He's going to unwind. And he's, he's up a piece. So Prague plays the most important move of the game thus far. Prague plays e5. That is such an important move. And he seizes the control back from black. <coughs> now that the queen sidestepped from the pin over here, the black king is stuck. The black king is stranded a little bit. e5 is a ruthless move. Opening up this diagonal deflecting a defender potentially from the center opening up the rook whatever it takes that center is going to open up and enabling knight e4 so you enable this move which you didn't have previously now black has to think you'll notice vincent spent 40 minutes on queen g8 this is the danger of top level preparation vincent had a very sharp line prepared and he didn't remember all the details so now you're 20 moves into the game, and you have to play queen g8, and now, now, now that's bad. And Prague just jumps on e5. Now, Vincent plays knight h5, blocking the king and threatening the queen. So now the queen's got to go. If bishop d3, the king is going to run to safety. So now, after, after knight h5, you have queen h4, another perfect move, right? Queen h4. Now, black can defend himself with queen g6 or king g6 or king g7. He plays queen g6. Now, Prague is still down a full piece. One, two, three. One, two, three, four. And it, yeah, you feel it. Okay, because if white falls asleep at the wheel for a second, white's going to get busted up. So he has to play perfectly. So he does. He plays bishop f6. What bishop f6 does is, of course, it threatens the rook. But it also defends the center. It also removes escape squares for the king. It also opens the g5 square for the knight. It also opens up the g file for the rook potentially in the future. Bishop f6 is a very precise move. Now, rook g8. Now, you would think Prague is silly for forcing his opponent to defend himself. Right? For forcing his opponent to defend himself. But, rather, 
not defend. I used the wrong word there. Attack himself. That's mate. Yeah, but watch this. What? Bishop d5. A perfect setup. Mate is guarded. Squares are taken away. Bishop is coming back to f3. It's a very, very tough spot. Bishop f5. Bishop f3. Now there is no way to protect the knight. Prague's going to win the knight back. This is insane maneuvering. All while down a piece. Stopping Black's king from escaping. He's going to go get the knight now. This is crazy stuff. Vincent plays rookie eight. He finally got all his pieces in the game. It's a very, very tense moment now. And in this position, there is one and only one move. The only move that maintains an advantage for white. Vincent's plan is give up the knight and take back in the center. Vincent's plan is take the knight, take, take, take on h3 with pressure. Proc stops all of that. He plays the cool, calm, and collected pawn to g3. And the idea of pawn to g3 is to take the knight with the bishop. Because he couldn't do that last move. Bishop h5, last move, you, you would have gotten mated. So he plays g3 to stop mate. So he senses he's got a threat. Black plays king h6, defending the knight. Now, Prague plays g4. What? Why didn't he just go g4? If he played g4 in the first place, black would have gone here. 95, threatening the bishop. And you can't take the pieces because you're pinned. That would have been the problem. What? Then what is the difference between g3, king h6, g4, and just g4 right away? Why did Prague waste a move to get the king to come forward to then go g4? I don't get it. What about knight e5? It's the positioning of the king. There would have been pawn to g5 check. And when the king is forced back, the queen is trapped. You say, no, it's not. Queen f6, you can't take. Bishop g6, double check. And anywhere the king moves, it's mate. Oh my god. Prague is so smart. He played g3. He spent 26 minutes on g3. And the idea was to force the black king up and then hit him with the sneaky g4. Because now g5 is the threat. The threat is not to take the pieces. The threat is to force the king forward, force him back, and then take on h5. This is insane. Prague slicing and dicing and understanding the dynamics of the position. This is crazy stuff. Black plays pawn takes c3. This move is overdue. The bishop is now opened up and the knight is hanging. A very, very, very tense moment. Will Prague be precise? Yes, he just takes back. The threat is still g5. The position is hanging in the balance. Black really can't do a whole lot. So he takes on e5. The tactics here are crazy. I mean, black is sniping the white king with literally everything. I mean, every piece is staring. But the idea this whole time was to go pawn to g5. And we know if the king goes to h7, we take. Let's say queen h6. You can't take, right? And there's no discover check. Yeah, you know what the winning move here is? Can't take the queen, right? Because you're... So why don't you just... That's gangster. Slide the king to the corner, look your opponent in the face, and smile. That's it. Queen is now hanging. Queen can't move. Because you just bulldoze. Oh my goodness. So, sensing that the position is quickly spinning out of control, Vincent Keimer plays. Queen takes g5. He sacrifices the queen. Bishop takes. Rook takes check. King h2. Now Prague is up. Prague has a queen for a knight and a bishop and a pawn. He's winning. He's definitely winning. Black plays knight g6, threatening the queen. Prague finishes things in style. Queen is hanging. Rook is here. Once again, the only move to get any advantage. Some of you might be inclined to play a move like queen c4. That's not the right move. The 
the right move in this position is to give the queen a kiss goodbye and play queen takes g5 check. Sacrificing the queen with a check and ready to win back a full rook. So you give up the queen for both of your opponent's rooks and you're winning because you have two rooks on the board and your opponent does not have enough pieces to fight off the two rooks. Uh, if you're actually playing a chess tournament, do not pick the queen up and give it a smooch. That is disgusting. I mean the queen in your life. Whoever the queen in your life is, all right? Uh, king takes g5, rook e8. And now the way Prague has to win this, rooks are endgame pieces. He's got to go for the pawns. He has to not hang his rooks, but he's got to go for the pawns. He's got to trade some knights for bishops. Got to go here. Black plays knight f4. And even this, and you may be wondering, why didn't Vincent play like c6, rook g1? He didn't want his king forced to the edge of the board, so he plays knight f4. And Prague is a simple man. He just takes the pawn. Takes the pawn. Vincent down to two minutes. Plays a5, getting the pawn out of the way. Now rook a8, chasing down the bishop. The bishop goes here and walks directly into the knight attack. We're going to be taking the pawn and promoting our a pawn. Or we'll take this and we'll win all the other pawns. Black's got all these great pieces, but white's king is completely safe. There is absolutely nothing you can do. Bishop takes f2. Prague captures the pawn on a5. Now he's got a passing a pawn, which is literally the worst pawn that black could possibly be defending. d5, and even this late into the game, with his knight hanging that he could casually move out of the way, Prague plays the best move. Prague plays the top computer move, the best move in the position, rook f1 bringing in the rook with the tempo, and the bishop has no safe square. The only safe square the bishop has is bishop h4, at which point white would take this pawn and get to the king. So black goes here, Prague is simple, simplify. Black now has three pieces left, rook b5, and you're just going to promote this pawn. Bishop takes h3, sacrificing the rook. The knight has to capture, and rook takes b6, and it's a red carpet. Nobody can stop the pawn. You would need to lose material. Bishop f1, a5, and f5, and white can just play a6, and doesn't have to play a6, he can play bishop a6, he can play a lot of things. And so that is why in this position, after rook takes b6, Vincent Keimer resigned. And Prague played 41 perfect moves. The opening was sharp. Vincent Keimer instigated with this variation that he played once before. They got into a very sharp tactical fight, and it was Prague who might have anticipated this, sacrificed the knight, and slowly, methodically played like Tetris with his pieces. Bishop g5, look at this, sliding them out of the way, making black play passively. But e5, what a, what a key idea to open up the position. They got tangled. Bishop f6, bishop d5, the perfect combo of attack and defense. And this idea of bishop f3, g3, threatening this, getting out of mate, and then hitting them with the sneaky follow-up g4. Showing them this, getting them to react, and g4 with the idea of g5. Absolutely lethal. Absolutely lethal game. And this game actually extended Prague's unbeaten streak in classical tournaments to 47 games. Unfortunately, he lost the next round, because that's life. But he played 47 games without losing a classical chess game. And uh, yeah, this one was 41 moves of perfection including a couple brilliancies, surgical precision late in the game, and uh, yeah, just awesome. I mean, it's just really, it's just from start to finish, it was a, it was a perfect game of chess. Uh, that's all I have for you today. That was a little bit of inspiration for you. Now all of you can, you know, feel inspired and go play a chess game and get like 32% accuracy, like me. Like I watch these top players, I'm like, oh, I feel inspired, and then I go and, and, and I have diarrhea. On the chessboard, and also, but sometimes, yep. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that's, a, that, that's a conversation for another video. Uh, you know the drill. Get out of here.